We're not clowning around, nor have we lost our heads. It's time for Blacephalon. This is one of Pokemon's more disturbing designs. You wouldn't necessarily think it just from looking at it, but you might get an inkling as there's something just a little bit off about the humanoid shape combined with a seemingly faceless head. It gets seriously unnerving when you realize Blacephalon is indeed an evil cloud. An evil cloud that makes its own head explode. Its Japanese name even means head goes boom. Whereas Blacephalon is not just a combination of blast and encephalon, or brain, but it's similar to the word acephalus, which means having no head. This otherworldly malevolence makes sense when you realize Blacephalon is one of the extra-dimensional ultra beasts, wielding the fittingly terrifying codename you be burst. Today, we're going to explore if Placephalon was able to inspire similar fear into the heads of the competitive scenes battlers. And so, we ask, how good was Placephalon actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Sadly, Blacephalon didn't use its signature move, Mind Blown, in the competitive scene. Strong as it was, it didn't quite need to go all the way to 150 base power when the cost was half of its health, no matter what. Blacephalon didn't need to make its own head explode to deal damage to be frightening. Indeed, ghost stories like those of one of Blacephalon's types are those meant to induce fright, the same reaction that greeted Blacephalon's introduction in Ultra Sun and Moon. Yeah, it was ridiculously frail alongside typing littered with significant weaknesses like Stealth Rock and Pursuit, the most notable of them, alongside Knock Off, Earthquake, and all sorts of water moves, but its offensive potential was up there with the biggest threats in the tier. Base 107 speed was excellent, getting the jump on already speedy threats like Garchomp, and went perfectly with Placephalon's pardon the pun, mind-blowing 151 base special attack stat, which for comparison's sake is one point higher than Kyogre's. Placephalon used these stats in service of its outstanding stab combination. Be it flamethrower, fire blast, or even the occasional overheat, Placephalon's fire stab ripped through a huge chunk of the tier's prominent defensive staples like Magirna, Celesteela, Tapu Bulu, and Tangrowth for super effective damage, while its sheer strength ensured any neutral target short of Chansey was getting absolutely eviscerated as well. Your Gliscor may be specially defensive, but it was nowhere near bulky enough to withstand Blacephalon's power. You had to do more than resist fire to answer Blacephalon too. Dragons and waters like Garchomp, the Mega Laddies, Toxapex, and Tapu Fini got utterly plowed by its secondary stab Shadow Ball, which was in its own right one of the most spammable moves in the tier thanks to its excellent super effective and neutral coverage coming off of a huge special attack stat. Now, Blacephalon's stabs were both resisted by that famed enemy of ghost types, Tyranitar, and its inescapable pursuit. Well, that's nothing Hidden Power Fighting couldn't fix, right? Yeah, well, Blacephalon arrived in the game with three IVs of 31, meaning it was unable to learn Hidden Power Fighting. However, that was not a game-breaking deterrent. Tyranitar wasn't on every team, and Blacephalon absolutely ruined just about everything else. Even Chansey was utterly ruined by Trick. Blacephalon's sheer strength with specs meant it often blasted even through common resist. Just look at Greninja, which resisted both stabs, yet wanted nothing to do with either of them, and it also dropped to Hidden Power Grass, which Blacephalon could run and often did to allow it to immediately threaten Gastrodon. Alternatively, Blacephalon could rip through Heat Ran even harder with HP Ground. Both of these, of course, hit Tyranitar super effectively. They didn't do quite enough damage to instantly threaten it, but they did ensure T-Tar needed to stay healthy lest it get bowled over. Blacephalon's frailty meant it couldn't get on the field easily on its own, at least with the help of its wheeling, dealing, switch move using teammates like Landorus Therian, Tornadus Therian, Tapu Koko, and Magirna. It had no issues getting in position against the many Pokemon it threatened to unleash its wickedly strong attacks and blast through the opposition. Once Blacephalon was in, it was incredibly difficult, often impossible, to prevent it from getting a KO. Its gigantic neutral power meant it slashed through common defensive cores consisting of Pokemon like Toxapex, Heatran, and Gliscor with utmost ease. Now, even with the issue of getting onto the field not being too difficult to work around, Blacephalon's frailty still was significant in that it provided next to no defensive utility for its team, and thus was fairly difficult difficult to slot onto teams. It was so frail that it didn't even want to switch into resisted stab moves, like those from Kartana and Tapu Bulu. If Blacephalon managed to somehow dissuade or fend off fighting coverage, like Focus Blast from Tapu Lele, it would have gone above and beyond what was expected of it. You put Blacephalon on the team to bring the pain, not guard against it. This was fine, but was restrictive. For contrast, OU's other frail offensive Pokemon still tended towards some sort of valuable defensive utility. For example, Astro Ninja's Water Shuriken kept a ton of threats in check 
check. However, Blacephalon made up for this fault with how easily it forced KOs against teams without Tyranitar, which were many. Plus, if built and played conscientiously, even the T-Tar weakness could be turned into an advantage. So Tyranitar pursued Trap Blacephalon. Cool. Except Blacephalon hit with two specs HP grasses or grounds, and T-Tar has now been shipped into range for one of its teammates. Something like Shift Gear Magirna, which would even get a free setup opportunity against a choice T-Tar locked into pursuit. Blacephalon was the epitome of high risk, high reward. Oftentimes, such risky Pokemon don't come close to compensating for their faults, but Blacephalon's incredible power and coverage, coming off of a speed stat that was frankly incredible for how insanely strong it was, meant it brought the results to make it worthwhile. Blacephalon established for itself a legitimate, thoroughly unique niche in Gen 7 OU. It was difficult to use, but immensely dangerous and thus rewarding for the innovative trainer. Blacephalon's incredible frailty and weaknesses to common moves meant it didn't have too significant of a presence in VGC, but it did have its own small little niche with its Choice Scarf set. It had an incredibly strong heat wave, especially for how fast it was. It was especially terrifying if it picked up a KO, since Beast Boost strengthening its special attack would make it even easier for it to threaten the remaining Pokemon. With Fire Blast in its arsenal, Wide Guard wasn't necessarily sufficient to guard against Blacephalon either. Now, while Blacephalon had an immensely threatening spread move, its main issue was its fatal weakness to pretty much all other common spread moves and so many attacking moves in general that using it was a real tightrope act. It could be KO'd at a moment's notice by nearly anything. The damage it dished out was quite high, which was of course always useful, but it wasn't so singular in this regard that it justified the hindrance of such incredible frailty. Thus, its niche was fittingly small. It did have a small smattering of placements though. Louis Gark used it to reach fourth at the Ecuador special event, pairing Blacephalon with Mega Charizard Y, whose sun would boost Blacephalon's heat waves to stratospheric levels and enable its sweeping capacity even further. Grandma Medi reached 13th with Blacephalon at the Sydney International, using Mega Lopunny's fake out to generate free turns for its heatwave threat. Catalina Castillo had Blacephalon's highest placement, reaching second at the Chile special event, also pairing it with Mega Charizard Y. Finally, Xavier Renda used Blacephalon to reach 43rd at the Columbus International, alongside none other than the mighty Mega Rayquaza. Interestingly, the latter three players all paired Blacephalon with Tapu Lele, whose Moonblast would help with dark types, as well as psychic terrain stifling priority with Scrappy's fake out. So overall, Blacephalon's place in Gen 7 VGC was at least worth mentioning, even if it didn't have any real tangible metagame impact. Blacephalon was hurt by Generation 8's removal of Hidden Power, but that was more than worthwhile if it meant the other big change in store for it, the removal of Pursuit. Now, if it faced Tyranitar, it didn't have to worry about getting trapped. It could simply fire off its attacks and, in conjunction with Hazards, wear T-Tar down risklessly. It took a while for Blacephalon to see usage in OU, though. When it appeared in the Crown Tundra, the metagame was instantly terrorized by another ghost type, Spectrier, who was incredibly broken for doing exactly the same kind of Specs Shadow Ball antics Blacephalon wanted to get up to, but being much, much faster. Another fire type, Cinderace, was also incredibly broken, much faster, and destroying the metagame as well. Thus, Blacephalon dropped to the earliest stage of Crown Tundra Yuyu. Blacephalon and Yuyu sounds like insanely overpowered, but was it so insane in practice? The answer was a yes that was both resounding and immediate. Spec smashed through everything with obscene ease, but at least you could out-offense it, right? Well, that wasn't really a viable option even in the fantasy world, where Blacephalon's fantastic base 107 speed was ignored, because if you ran a super fast team to try and beat it that way, it would simply destroy you with a choice scarf set, which instantly collected one hit KOs against all manner of frail Pokemon, and quickly snowballed from its first KO thanks to its special attack raised via Beast Boost. Checks like Chansey, Incineroar, and Coma O, with the latter's bulletproof ability, protecting it from Shadow Ball, were utterly ruined by Trick from both sets. Answering Blacephalon was completely unreasonable. It was rarely even manageable through forcing choice locks thanks to its sheer power, but it could also bypass even that by running a substitute calm mindset with speed and bulky V so Beast Boost would raise its speed. This set also completely dominated Chansey. The player base immediately demanded Blacephalon's ban, and indeed the first slate of votes in Crown Tuncher UU saw Blacephalon get promoted to UU BL. Once OU had calmed down, having banned Blacephalon's competitors Spectre and Cinderace, while also banning another amazing Specs user in Magirna and a Dark type in Urshifu for good measure, the field was clear for Blacephalon to do its thing, and thus it once again reared its exploding head. It was easier than ever for Blacephalon to hit the field. In addition to switch move support from its old pals Lander Styrian, Tornado Styrian, and Tapu Koko, as well as U-turn from the new Corviknight, it was also backed by one of the tier's best pillars, the incredibly reliable Teleport Slowking, who easily set Blacephalon up to shatter opposing teams. These switch move happy teammates let Blacephalon grab opportunities to blow things up left and right against popular walls like Malmetal, Ferrothorn, Corviknight, Buzzswole, Slowbro, Slowking, and 
Galarian Slow King. The tier had generally become accustomed to spec Shadow Balls from Dragapult, which were strong but not overwhelmingly so. Thus, when Bacephalon and its astonishing base special attack 51 points higher than Dragapult showed up, it was a real shock to the system. Popular bulky Pokemon used in lieu of true Ghost Resist, which were hard to come by such as Heatran, Clefable, Toxapex, and especially Defensive Lander Asterion, were decent to solid against Spex Dragapult, but got absolutely shellacked by Blacephalon. Balance that got by without a Ghost Resist were rendered nearly unviable by Blacephalon. It was even stronger than Spectrier. Blacephalon wasn't just a wall breaker against Balance teams though. Given how excellent it was in the role and how popular Balance was in Gen 8 OU, that would have been enough. However, it could also flip the tables against faster offense, ordinarily getting revenge killed by Pokemon like Kartana, Weavile, Dragapult, Zeraora, and Scarf Tapulele was the main thing keeping Blacephalon from bowling teams over. However, with the Choice Scarf, Blacephalon went from getting run over by such speedy teams to being one of the most threatening Pokemon they could face, cleaning them up ruthlessly late game. With this ability to threaten any type of team, Blacephalon was able to slot on a variety of teams itself. The player base recognizing its widespread excellence began using it more and more, and eventually, Blacephalon went from that UUBL wallbreaker with a niche in OU to OU proper in its own right through usage, all the way to earning itself a spot among the upper echelon of OU's wallbreakers, forcing opponents to prepare for it earnestly rather than their previous modus operandi, the awkward dance of attempting to play around it in the unlikely event they faced one. It wasn't like it was an impossible task to deal with Blacephalon itself. Its stealth rock weakness was quite significant after all. However, the challenge was not beating Blacephalon and Blacephalon only. It was to beat it and its team before Blacephalon did so much damage that its teams would have easy pickings to finish the game. Thanks to its ruthless efficiency in carrying out its tasks on both specs and scarf sets, as well as the sets reach being wide enough to allow for flexibility and fitting on a different style of teams, Blacephalon saw a great amount of tournament success. So all in all, Generation 8 was another successful one for the often headless clown. Blacephalon was once again not a VGC staple in Gen 8, but it had enough positives to compile a legitimate, albeit small, niche for itself. In Series 7, its primary use was the same choice scarfer that had appeared in Generation 7. Not only did it spam those fast, powerful heat waves that had great cleanup potential, its fast stab Shadow Ball was also an excellent weapon to have against the many excellent opposing ghosts in the format, like Dragapult and Spectre. Being able to strike Cresselia super effectively was valuable too. Blacephalon already found success right after its release. At the victory Road Tundra Challenge, Adrian Hurley used it to reach 6 and Charles Jones used it to reach 26 respectively. In Series 8 and 9, however, Blacephalon changed its playstyle up a bit. Its most common item was Focus Sash. Scarf was still used, but Sash had approximately double its usage. Players began valuing Blacephalon's freedom and move choice, not having to lock into one of its stabs and thus be easier to play around. Its unboosted speed was already excellent, and this allowed it to threaten opposing teams more immediately, rather than being held back for a late-game Scarf Heatwave sweep. Sadly, the actual tour success didn't come with this development. Of course, any metagame where Incineroar was common was going to be one that be difficult for Blacephalon, to say nothing of its deathly frailty, but even still, its usage was incredibly low. Its only usage across both Series 8 and 9 was Ronald Seat, who used it to reach 15th at the Asia Players' Cup Singapore Qualifier. Blacephalon wasn't bad in and of itself, it was just difficult to justify using, given all the generally more reliable options in the tier. And that's it, so how good was Blacephalon actually? Blacephalon was the epitome of a glass cannon, except unlike something like Rampardos, it had the speed to make use of its incredible power. In its two generations of OU, it has repeatedly put on incredible displays of strength, shattering all sorts of targets with nigh peerless ease. Sure, its incredible frailty is quite a hindrance, as is its stealth rock weakness, but Blacephalon's immense power made working around these worthwhile. Now, it didn't have much in the way of VGC presence, as that non-existent defensive profile was even easier to capitalize on in a doubles format, especially with Blacephalon's brutal weakness to spread moves, but its immense power did give it a small niche and a few placements. It's funny to imagine something so strong and fast in Yu but Blacephalon even appeared there briefly in Gen 8 while OU was being overrun by more broken monsters, though of course, it blasted apart everything in sight just like you'd expect it to do, and was instantly banned. Overall, Blacephalon's competitive career has been short, but successfully explosive. Thanks for watching everyone, and as always, if you liked the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Wipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know what do you think about competitive Blacephalon? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments. Also, thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos. And thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.